All right, hello, Inverted Zoology people. Uh, here to begin the actual discussion on our on our chapters on the individual taxa that we're going to cover this semester. So we're going to begin with not the full detail of how did we progress from the protestan, what we call the metazoa, into the periphera. So that's a whole different course, a whole different lecture, uh, a lot of detail on how that transition took place. Again, we know the evolutionary concepts, we know selection, gene flow, drift, mutation, all that stuff. But somehow, some way, life went from a single cell, the protestan, metazoan type of organism uh, into this, uh, this new category that we now call kingdom animalia. So again, uh, the early chapter in the book kind of talks a little bit about that transition. It's hypothetical. Um, phylogenetically, it's hard to determine that because there's not a lot of fossilized evidence of those very early, early type of uh, metazoans there, right? But we're going to jump now into the peripheron category. So peripherons, are, peripherons fall within the kingdom animalia. And, and I know you've heard the term animalia, but taxonomically speaking, what makes an animal an animal? So a couple of qualifications have to be in place. First, we have to have a eukaryotic cell. There's no prokaryotic animals. All animals are eukaryotic. All animals are multicellular. And again, the peripherons kind of blur that line a little bit, but uh, we have multicellular organisms, eukaryotic organisms, not protected by a cell wall. Um, as far as energy storage, uh, they have a polysaccharide that we call glycogen. So glycogen is our polysaccharide storage molecule. And poly, uh, that polysaccharide glycogen is specific and unique to kingdom animalia. Uh, if you know something about plants, plants use the molecule starch. Right? It's a similar polysaccharide, but molecularly it is very different. Right? So uh, we're talking about the glycogen molecule. Uh, for our um, our energy storage, liver tissue, um, and also stored in muscle tissue. And that brings us to another big, big, big important evolutionary type of cell, which is the muscle cell, and then collectively the muscle tissue. So we're going to have multi, multiple types of, of muscle tissue. We have a skeletal muscle. Uh, we have cardiac muscle for the heart. We have visceral muscle for the uh, internal organs, but muscle is unique to animals, right? None of the other taxonomic categories have uh, that type of tissue. So they can move in some sense, uh, but they don't have that actual contractile actin and myosin fiber uh, kind of mechanism there. And once we have this ability to generate force and contraction strength with this muscle tissue, that coevolution that we kind of uh, discussed a little bit on the last exam, uh, we have the coevolution of two cells. So we have a, a nerve cell, which is then able to sense and feel uh, order commands. And then we have a muscle cell that is able to kind of follow the commands. If there's danger, we're able to kind of move away from danger. And, and again, it's a neat coevolution of these two cell types within a single organism over time. So today, if you analyze humans, uh, sort of the, the last branch of our uh, animalian tree, uh, we see very highly evolved nerve and muscle tissue. Right? So the neurons, these uh, myofibrils, the muscle tissue are uh, products of, again, millions, billions of years of evolution. But it had to have a start somewhere. And, and this peripheral group or this peripheral group is going to be that, uh, that initial evolutionary step that we had now, the introduction of nerve and muscle tissue, glycogen storage, uh, this uh, sort of uh, loss of cell wall, that kind of stuff. So what makes an animal an animal? All these characteristics collectively here. Uh, going back to the big phylogenetic tree of uh, page 21 in the book, figure 2.2. Again, if you understand what phylogeny is and you look at this tree like man this is a whole lot of information thrown in one you know in one step in one page there right but we're starting 
at this very early branch. So again, we have the metazoa, the precursors to the animals here. And then we have an interesting sort of branch still debated uh, phylogenetically as to which branch actually came first, if they do share a single ancestor or they are separate. So again, the tenophores are, are listed first. I'm going to present them, but I'll wait till Monday to get to those. Uh, right now, I'm going to present on the peripherans. So this branch right here is our humble start to kingdom animalia, phylum peripheral. Uh, I'm going to use the term symmetry in, in my discussion today. So when we talk about planes of symmetry, um, basically what this means is if we have some sort of organism and we divide it or put an imaginary line down that organism, can we generate a symmetrical image, a mirror image? Right? So for humans, uh, we're going to exhibit what we call bilateral symmetry, this butterfly. We put that imaginary line down the middle and we have a mirror image on, on each side. So for humans, if you put a line down our face, uh, we have a mirror image, one ear on one side, the other ear, one eye, another eye. Uh, so that's bilateral symmetry, kind of considered more evolved. Huh? A little bit less evolved, we have what we call radial symmetry, where we could have multiple lines and still generate mirror images. Right? So we have multiple planes of symmetry uh, radial symmetry. Spherical symmetry, we don't see too often in the animal kingdom, um, but we're going to get into a, a, another type of symmetry that we call asymmetry. So asymmetry uh, is where there is no type of, of mirror image. It doesn't matter where we find the plane, we're not going to generate any symmetry. So again, that would be the first type of symmetry that we find in kingdom animalia. So it came first the asymmetry and then radial symmetry and then most evolved is this bilateral symmetry. So when we look at sponges, peripherans, uh, we're going to look at this idea here. So welcome, welcome, welcome to phylum periphera, uh, the sponges, right? And a lot of you probably learned about this category with a very famous little cartoon character there, right? It's uh, not drawn accurately, right? I do see some symmetry there. Sponges are technically asymmetrical, right? And they are the most primitive, debatable with the tenophores. Uh, tenophores and sponges are the most primitive of all the animal species, right? Uh, they are aquatic. Uh, they basically live in salt water. They evolved in salt water, but they have radiated out into uh, fresh water, lakes and streams and ponds. Um, but we associate them primarily with the ocean, aquatic marine environments. Uh, as I go through the discussion, some terms that you have to know, vocabulary terms, uh, are going to be what we call coanocytes and spicules. Right? So I'll, I'll address those. Right? But before I get into the lecture, uh, I do want to kind of just talk a little bit about a, just an old little story and a little detail that we uh, that we deal with when we talk about this character here, right? I sh I'm sure all of you know of SpongeBob, right? Or in Spanish, Bob Esponja, right? Uh, but in, in, in my home, he's called by a different name, right? So I don't know if you have elderly, you know, grandparents or old tios and tias that uh, they don't really know too much. They're not up to date with current cartoons and stuff like that, characters. So way back when SpongeBob barely first appeared, um, we got a Christmas list, right? Okay, yeah, we're going to go to the mall. We're going to go, you know, get presents. Do you need us to pick up anything for you? And she wanted to get a gift for one of her nephews or somebody, right? I forgot who, but um, she said, well, bring me a, you know, Spanish, um, uh, something, a toy or something of of el panecito, right? Of the little bread. Right? Like, okay, tia, this, I don't know. I don't know what little bread you're talking about. ¿Cuál panecito, tia? What, what little bread? Um, sí, el panecito ese, that little bread that comes out on TV. El panecito con los shorts, con los, you know, los pantalones cortos, right? And we're thinking, what, what panecito, tia? What? And then she went and showed us a picture, and there was Mr. Bob there, Mr. SpongeBob. So in my house, when we talk about SpongeBob, he's called El Panecito, right? So that, that name stuck for years and years and years and years. So we still call 
SpongeBob the panecito today, right? So kind of like a little square bread, and that's what she thought it was, right? But um, not a panecito, an actual primitive, very humble beginnings for the animal kingdom, right? So we continue on. And if you were, if you've been fortunate enough, I hope you have, I really hope you have uh, to experience the world, Earth, not just on dry land, but actually underneath the ocean surface, right? It's a whole different world, right? And 75% of the of the planet is covered in, in water, right? So if you tour and you see every possible continent, you're only seeing 25% of the planet, right? If you think about that. So a whole diverse world underneath the water. And uh, when you snorkel, when you scuba dive, you come across things like this sometimes, right? And it looks like somebody left a lot of paint rollers. You think, well, what are these doing here, right? What are these paint rollers uh, that, that somebody left these colorful things down in the ocean. And again, they're not paint rollers. That right there is an animal, right? That's a very primitive animal. Uh, that That's a sponge, basically. So different kinds of sponges, right? I'll kind of show you some different pictures here in a bit. Uh, here we have a fire sponge. Uh, we have uh, bath sponges. Um, it's different types of sponges. Some are a little bit more squishy. Some are a little bit more solid. Uh, some are branched. But again, we get into that idea of asymmetry, asymmetrical body plans there. You can get quite large. This is a big, massive aggregation of sponges. All that is one thing. Uh, one thing here. So one body, one sponge. Little paint roller looking things. And basically, the the sponges have two kind of levels of, of, of body plan, right? So one, actually, the sponge is is a collection of these little cells that we call collar cells or coanocytes. That's what that translates to, like a collar and a site. So collar cell, coanocyte. And it's basically a cell with a trap, a little net mechanism, this collar. We have a cell with a long flagella, a little flagella waves back and forth, uh, generates oceanic you know, movement, water movement, and little food, little junk in the water gets trapped in the net, in the collar, gets moved to the actual cell where the cell can then digest and feed upon whatever's, whatever's caught there. Right? So we have the collar cell, the feeding cell. We have a, another sponge composition cell. We call this the amoebocyte. So these two cells kind of work in collaboration to capture and then completely digest that prey. So a primitive body plan, right? And if you can kind of look at this paint roller, this, this uh, sponge, so we have that big opening, a big hole, and that big hole at the top is called the osculum. So I, I do want you to know that term, the osculum. So the osculum is a big hole, basically. It's a big hollow space, right? The hole. And then this big uh, empty space here that we call the spongoseal. So spongoseal just means a hollow space inside of the sponge. So spongoseal and then exiting out the osculum. And of all of the, the organisms, right, sponges have the most pores, right? That's why we call them the poriferans, full of pores. Uh, they're 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 full of holes. They're holy, right? Sponges are holy things, right? Uh, they're full of holes, and all of these collar cells. So this collar cell here on the right, if we look here, kind of hard to see, but little collar cell, collar cell, collar cell. All the collar cells are kind of facing the the collars. The nets are facing that hollow sponge seal area. So they're wiggling back and forth, generating water currents. Water comes from the outside, in through the pores, into the sponge seal. All the little food is, is well, most of the food, whatever they can, is, is trapped. And then they kind of send that water out. So in essence, they're kind of like filtering the water, right? So um, any particulate matter gets trapped by these little cells. And then the clean water is released out of, of, the, of the osculum. So we have, again, the collar cells. And then we have the little amoebocyte cells, all kind of uh, sort of immersed 
in, in this kind of tissue that we call the mesohyl. So it's kind of the matrix that, that all the stuff is, is kind of, um, you know, deposited in and, and growing in. And um, all these three things, the mesohyl, the spongocele, I should say the mesohyl, the collar cell, and the mebocytes all collectively, collectively together make what we call a sponge. Right? Now, if you think about this, you're at the bottom of the food chain, right? You're a stationary sponge feeding, generating glycogen, uh, and you, you can't move. So you think it'd be an easy uh, prey item for something to come and just start eating at that tissue. But there's a, a level of protection. So if you notice here, we have these little yellow spikes. Yellow spikes, and we're going to call these the spicules. So kind of like the strategy of a cactus where the cactus has the spines on the outside, the sponges do the same thing, but they bring the spines to the inside. So if you were to bite uh, a mouthful of sponge, you're going to get all of these little spines uh, stuck in your mouth. It would not be pleasant. And some of these spines actually uh, have a toxin associated with them. So you, they stick in you, they break off or they fragment in you, and then they release that little toxin and it, it can be very, very painful. So uh, if I backtrack a little bit, so why then these fancy colors? Why this fancy color? It's not trying to camouflage. Uh, we're going to talk more about this in, in future lectures, but uh, this is a type of warning coloration. Right? It's trying to advertise to, to things around, I'm here, but I'm not edible. Right? Because I'm brightly colored, I'm trying to advertise that I'm not um, here to be eaten upon, parasitized upon, preyed upon. Um, it's a type of warning coloration for other organisms. And, and we see that a lot, these bright colors. So bright oranges, bright yellows, uh, bright oranges, reddishes, uh, all of these types of, of colors there. So this is what spicules look like up close. So if you were to get a mouthful of, of spicules again, that would not be pleasant. And the spicules themselves can be made up of silica, basically of glass. If you've been at the beach, you see these little like, quartzite, little clear pebbles, clear sand grains. That's silica that can be transformed into these sharp spines uh, or calcium carbonate, which is like seashell, like a, um, you know, sort of a very tiny seashell, little fragments, little spikes. It could be all different types of, of shapes of the spicules, none of which are pleasant to, to be stuck in your body, in your mouth. And, you know, and, and again, that's the whole point. They have evolved these spicules for protection. So same concept, just a different picture, right? I hope you're starting to utilize some of these vocabulary terms. So we have the big hollow space that is the, that's, you know, brings in water from the pores. That water is then released out through the, and then basically once the water is in here, it gets picked up by the coanocytes, uh, moved to the amoebocytes, um, and then again, we have this aggregation of uh, cells. It's kind of a very weak tissue. We, we can kind of call it a tissue, but it, it, again, it just barely, barely qualifies as a, as a functional tissue and as, a, as an animal, basically, right? But the humble beginnings for our sponges. So that's a sponge. I just, I just thought that was an interesting picture, but that is a sponge, right? That one is almost symmetrical in a way, yeah? But big old osculum, big old osculum, osculum, all the pores in there, that big spongy seal. And then not visible, but we would have all the spicules and then the collar cells in there lining uh, this, uh, this uh, spongy seal. Uh, I'm not going to get too involved with this, but we can get a little bit more elaborate with sponges. We can look at different body plants. Um, the big paint roller ones kind of would be within this idea of what we call asconoid or maybe psychonoid type shapes where we have a large central spongy um, spongy seal and we have all these little pores right so it's a generic first level starter you know series of, of sponges and then we can kind of get a little bit more evolved a little bit more surface area so we can more efficiently trap food 
and we call this psychonoid. And then the most highly evolved of the sponges would be what we call leuconoid. So we've lost that big central sponge seal and basically now uh, make it more difficult for water to pass through the osculum. But by doing this, uh, we then will basically make it easier to filter. Right? Now, for those of you that, that aren't going to study sponges for a career, right? You're going to go into medicine. Can we analyze then the idea of a functional kidney in humans, right? So can we see how, how possibly a kidney can start to, to evolve from a very simple structure to a more elaborate structure? Okay, and again, this is not a, the sponge is not a kidney and the sponge is not going to become a kidney. But from the laws of physics, uh, I hope you can kind of start to see how things can happen from an evolutionary process, right? Um, going through this idea of uh, going from primitive sponges to more advanced sponges here. Same idea, just different examples of our different asconoid, psychonoid, and leuconoid sponges here. Um, I do want to kind of mention this one a little bit, this, the fire sponge. I don't know if any of you do happen to go to uh, Puerto Peñasco, Rocky Point, maybe for spring break. You know, I don't know what's going to happen this year with the COVID mess. But um, if you do happen to be in the Mazatlan area, the Puerto Peñasco area, uh, there is an interesting sponge there. We call it the fire sponge. And I, when I first went the first time, I thought, well, it's a fire sponge. I, you know, read the little book like, oh, fire sponge, cool. I thought, well, it looks... Uh, it, they call it fire sponge because it's so brightly colored. I guess it looks like fire, like orange fire. All right, okay, cool. There was a piece washed up on the beach. So I picked it up and I was trying to show students, you know, I tore it apart and, oh, this is a fire sponge and this is the osculum. And, and in a few seconds, my hands started to feel like they were on fire, right? And I very quickly found out it's called a fire sponge, not because it looks like fire, but it's a fire sponge because if you get the spicules in you, it feels like your hands are on fire, right? So it was not a pleasant experience. I was miserable for several hours and a couple of days after still trying to get all those spicules that had, you know, they're very tiny and they break inside your cell, they release the toxins. So just be aware if you're um, in these types of environments, you know, it was my fault for tearing the sponge. If I just maybe picked it up and analyzed it, but I started tearing it apart I didn't have a scalpel at the time, so I wanted them to see the internal aspects. And, and basically, that's what generated the, the discomfort there. Yeah? But it's just uh, FYI, right? And with that, that will then conclude our discussion on the sponges. So a small category, not too much to discuss, but it's a start. It's a humble beginning for our, um, our animalian group. So with that, um, this will be the last lecture that I... Uh, upload for this week. Um, I'll work through the weekend and I will have the Tino Fours available uh, early next week. Right? So with that, you'll have a good weekend. Uh, stay warm. It's supposed to be very cold this weekend. Uh, be, be nice to your pets. Bring them in. And I will be seeing you on uh, the next discussion. Right? You'll have a great one.